Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries, of course. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on a very special quarterly podcast crew interviews with very talented and creative people, and I'll leave this up to whoever wants to start. Uh, go for it. Barney. Oh, I was going to say you go for it, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Barney. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm Barney Smith from StoryComic.com, and I host a uh, a few podcasts. Um, the the first one is called Story Comic Presents, where I interview amazing storytellers and artists. And uh, the other one I interview is I interview authors and artists from Vermont, and I also do a children's book author podcast as well. So, yeah. very nice. Um, I'm Jeff Haas. Um, you know me from Traversing the Stars podcast. Or interviewed the stars of TV, movies, comics, and books. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Cody from Keeping It Geekly is uh, is unfortunately away at the moment here, but he'll be back, I'm sure, for the next quarterly interview as well, too. So check out his website, of course, Keeping It Geekly. Uh, and I'm not going to do his intro because he can, he's the only one that can actually do that. <laughs> you know, it's been a couple of months since we've all joined up together here as well. And what has everyone been up to, and it doesn't matter who starts these days, since we last talked, what, is, what has been your progression in the show, in yourself, technology, Barney. et cetera? <laughs> you know what? It's really interesting. I actually had, so a lot of things have changed. I kind of had this, um, a, a moment of clarity in a way, to think about the fact that we are you literally, the, the work that we do as podcasters, we provide a service. And then kind of the question comes down to is like, who that service is for, you know, we, it's, it's a dual service. We provide services for our guests, but we also provide education and entertainment for, for, for listeners and viewers of those that tune into our shows. Um, and it was kind of that realization is just realizing that the, the hobby we do is purely based off of the fact that we actually have a skill set and something that is a marketable skill set of, of creating content for content creators in a way. And I, it was one of those moments of uh, uh, inspiration as I thought of based off of talking to all of you all the time. The, uh, the other thing, which is new to me as well is since we talked last, I am now the proud owner of three terrestrial radio stations. So I am now um, in learning so much about fcc regulations so that's been <laughs> super fun for me um and uh but yeah so it's uh taking my the, the love of interviews and podcasts that i've been doing and been able now to actually put it into an fcc regulated format <laughs> wow so no swearing you can't swear on your trust your no radios swearing. oh jeez. <laughs> oh golly oh geez now, now... Oh, geez. oh biscuits <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 Well done. You got you to discuss um, at some point, how do you, how you buy station since yeah. I don't, I don't know where <laughs> I can't afford to buy a station. <laughs> I, I don't think I can oh. do the same thing up here in Canada. So, I mean, I, I'm oh, gonna you, to... you, you, you'd be surprised about how cost, cost effective. And you'd be surprised that if you're able to show the data of the station and, and its reach or like it's, it's advertising revenue as it's coming in, I had no money. Like I had, I basically had to take out a business loan to do it. it. And literally it's, you Google how to write a business plan. You put it, you put it together and then you go to a bank. It's actually, it's less complicated to buy a radio station than it is to run a radio station. So the <laughs> easy part of buying it is actually the, um, it, that, that's the easiest part. And I guarantee where you two live in your, in your geographic area, there's probably a radio station for sale. Interesting. Oh wow! Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know, you, um, I'm comparatively small time now compared to Barney. <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> um, I have I, I I have not accomplished any major goals at this moment. <laughs> uh, let's see. I gotta try to think of something to make myself sound interesting. Give me a minute. I am about to be unemployed, so that's good too. And uh, I have a, a podcast that's now moving into its uh, two year. I'm about. Uh, four months away from my uh, two year Congrats. anniversary of my podcast. So there's that. I'm trying to figure out why Yuhu's not giving me, I mean, Yuhu, um, 
uh, YouTube is not giving me any money because I reached the goals that they, the new goals that they have. And yet revenue has not found its way to me. So I'm trying to figure out what the hell's going on with that. That whole thing, I think is only a sliver of a percentage of what they're actually offering when you get to the thousand and the yes. 4,000 hours. So as much of a beacon of hope of that is for, for smaller channels, it's still not enough to really streamline that process, unfortunately. Yeah. I got really excited too. When, when they, when they said what the new goals were, I was like, I'm that I have that. And then I, then, then they, they said, then, you know, they were like, now do the paper, you know, the, the kind of the online paperwork for, I was like, all right, did it. So I'm sitting back going, come on money. Here it comes. And now it's like uh, uh, three weeks later. I'm like, come on money. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, compared to both of you, I'm, I'm still doing what I'm doing. I, I have changed up the business model a little bit more. I've streamlined the, the show, the process itself here. So I've I've removed the rapid fire interviews that I had and I've streamlined it to uh, one free service and one paid service. The paid service is now Sunday through Saturday from 9 a.m. till 8 p.m. Eastern time. And whatever you schedule is is what you get booked on. So I'm offering business aspects in terms of more promotion, uh, et cetera, a few other things that I've. I'm kind of testing a B testing right now, but it's just a new news change from what was originally $25 is now a lot more feasible for offering marketing services as well as editing the interview and promoting it on multiple platforms. So that's my initial change in the last couple of months since we last chatted, but I also, I did a live stream stream today with Brad Geiger, who I hadn't talked to in 13 years. So I think that was a huge like mm. win for myself and uh, amazing person. Love chatting with him uh, uh, as well, because it just his wealth of 20 years of comic knowledge and webcomics.com and, you know, why he switched to not safe for work comics through his Patreon and things like that. I learned so much just in that interview alone that I'm going to have had time just like chopping it down to bite sized pieces. So that was fun as well. And then finally, well, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I thought it was great. I thought it was just just actually before this one. So worked out really well. The last thing I was on was uh, the Global Discussion Podcast, which was a nice quick half hour interview show. He asked about five questions and I thought his format was really tight. Simon Hodgkins is the guy's name. He does a really good show, very clean, very tight. So I think it's something that I think you guys should hop on over to his his channel yeah. and showcase your works and your styles as well. I think you'd be a great benefit to his, uh, his format too. So well, that's what I've been doing. You know, I found, um, I interviewed someone yesterday, um, two days ago. Um, and he talking about, yeah, he has a, a sub stack. Um, apparently it's a free sub stack, but it's, um, he's, according to him is wicked interactive. People are like comment, they do comments. And because people are um, signing up for it, the people who sign up for it are not dicks. They're like, in, in like, uh, generally like, conversationally decent people even when you know um and i was wondering you know we should do a set up a podcast crew Substack sure. um for people That's to post idea. to post our stuff to announce new uh, upcoming guests and things uh, upcoming releases um my understanding is that it's free um the one he did is free i mean if we can sell that that'd be decent for people each one of us do something yeah and we can schedule our posts i know i know cody has his Substack as well too and i I've been doing mine um, like more of once a month, twice a month type deal only because I just have so much content. I just don't want to flood people with because I've had people like unsubscribe. <laughs> so, so you have to be li very limited with what you do. But I, I love Barney's approach to um, to your newsletter. I love that nice, simple, clean format for what you post. Like that's that's really impressive that you get to do it week to week on that. Well, it's like it's almost to the point, too, is like I've, I've noticed there's a really good it's there's a. You know, I put on my MBA hat for a second. Is that the? It's there's a really good book called The Uncommon Service, meaning, um, basically, is that, and this goes along the lines of what we do as well. Is that you pick, pick what you're really good at, and then be unabashedly mediocre at everything else. Be proudly mediocre at other things, and that's what it comes down to. When it, when it, like for for that is that it's also thinking from the social media perspective. You cannot put a hundred percent into Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, TikTok. You know, na naming it. There's always every year. There's going to be a new thing, 
So choose where you're where where you've created your family, where where you've created your audience, and double down on that. And then the ones dip your toe in it. I've noticed for me is that it's I'm I, I'm really I, my audience is on Instagram and on Facebook. My group, um, I got about three thousand three thousand followers on Facebook. I got you know um, you know fifteen hundred on Instagram. I've got. 200 on twitter and so it's the point of like so i'm gonna spend more energy i use twitter to interact not promote but interact with with the people i want to interact yeah. with but people are tuning in to story comic on facebook and on instagram and 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 so i know that we're all like all of us ever you know all of the conversations we're in it's like we're always you know asking each other advice and they're or just seeing like, like how are you doing this on tiktok how are you do-? and like it's just one of those things that like it's it's do you spend more time trying to create a new audience on a new genre or do you want to spend more time in creating a, a you know working with the audience you've already established in another place and so and really and this is the, the, the best part about this there's no right answer on what's the best place to find find that because what works for you know what works for you curtis and what you know and then what works for you jeff is that you're more successful in different avenues on social media than, than I am. And it really is about where do you double down on interacting with, you know, your, your viewership or your listenership. Mm. I think it comes back to what type of content you're posting as well too. So we all have long format shows. I mean, for the past six months or so, I've been doing shorter content and posting that as well too. And certain avenues, you're right, certain social medias, it, it hits really well, depending on the title, depending on the description. Um, I'm finding more hits on uh, Facebook reels and YouTube mm. shorts for certain content. And then sometimes Instagram just blows up. I'll hit some topic really well there. And even TikTok for, for the limited interactions you get with that mm. does okay. You know, it'll get like an average of 200 views, say, you know, in a week or whatever. I mean, I did one with um, with Matt uh, uh, Sorcier uh, talking about undervaluing, you know, don't undervalue yourself as a creative person. And that just blew up uh, like everywhere. So uh, obviously that struck a nerve with some people. Yeah, but, I will say I'm I'm, I'm like um, reels. Um, but the one thing I, I am learning is that and, and I've learned I've known it for a while, but I just I learned more every day that um, I find I'm finding success unpredictable. Um, for every, every episode, you know, every time I think of an episode that's going to break and do awesome, doesn't every episode I'm thinking to myself, well, whatever, I just wanted to do it breaks big. And I'm thinking to myself between the reels, TikTok, and YouTube shorts and things and everything else, I find it incredibly unpredictable. What's going to hit. Like I did mm. this one interview with this guy, um, Jim, um, uh, from, um, uh, the TV show, um, rise of empires, Ottoman, right. 1700 views holy shit right i did this other interview with someone who i was like i, th- I told you about that kurt that thing would be like i thought it'd be massive i was like oh this is gonna be my big one for the month nothing and i was like <laughs> i can't for the life of me gauge what is happening here <laughs> well, yeah. i mean it's, it's funny is that like what are the people like i've come to realize that i want when i sit down and interview with people i don't interview people that i think the general audience wants to yes. hear. I interview the people that I want to talk to. And then what happens is in turn, I create an audience of people that have like-minded interests mm. that I have. So it's like the, the people that like, you know, some of the, the bigger folks that I interviewed were people that were meant a lot to me during my childhood. So it's, so it's, so it's, it's so fun to like, talk to some of these folks and i i'm completely in awe when i see some of those guests that you have on your that show <laughs> yeah. like jeff when i see like your reels and like your tiktok I'm like how the heck did jeff get that person on <laughs> like, like like it was like um it's, it's amazing to see like all these like all these amazing like actors that you you're able to like get on your shows have been so fun I know. To watch. just wait till monday I, i'm reasoning uh joe casada oh nice <laughs> <laughs> just just another day in the office for traversing the stars right you know like, i'll say the one thing i do well is get guests i do everything else badly but the one thing i do well is get guests <laughs> I, I have some advice for your for your short reels and all that other stuff as well too in terms of like we can do this off the air but i think that your short your short reels the format you have is perfect for 
subtitles. So if you use CapCut and it auto generates the subtitles and you just change a couple of colors on certain keywords or whatever, as mm-hmm. that person is talking, your I think your shorts are going to just blow up because you, because of the guests as well, too. I, I'm open to learning anything. I will say I'm technically, I, for as technology goes, I'm fairly illiterate. I will, I, I, okay. You know how you, um, if you see my shorts, right. And you know how it's, I had now put on, you know, watch a full episode on mm-hmm. uh, Tourist the stars on YouTube. Right. I just learned that like, six months ago how to do that on an editing equipment i i'm, I'm at that level where i just learned that you can layer things on, on, on a piece of it so yeah i'm pretty illiterate when it comes to technology i'll, I'll give you a quick five minute video how to use cap cut honestly it'll just blow your mind at the simplicity of it as well as it'll just get your shorts to that really that next level well i will say too though the thing with shorts i've noticed too unpredictability yeah um i okay one of my most Usually, until recently, my most consistent success was Star Trek interviews, right? Mm-hmm. On on my main uh, show, right? I get they get hits regularly, and I and then pretty good rain, pretty consistent. The shorts don't do anything for Star Trek usually. Now, I, I have not been able to find consistency in length of time. It's not necessarily topic. Sometimes it has that thing where um, it hits, it trends for a little while, and you get that big boost. And and other times, I never get the boost. And it, it must admit, it boggles my mind. That I can I can never figure it out. But it's it's like it's like playing a game. Like, hmm, what's gonna happen today? <laughs> and then you know, and it, it, it's it, it is crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, the one thing I do well is get guests, and and I've had a pretty good run for the most part. Um, it, it, so far, everything else is what I'm not doing as well. <laughs> so, who are some of the the upcoming guests that you both have that in the in the next couple of uh, weeks slash months? I, I'm booked out now until, until September right now. And what I had to do, I usually had to do twice. I'm, and I, I, th- I think I learned this from you, Curtis, is that I used to do Tuesdays and Thursdays. And now what I'm doing is just like I'm bunching everything into one day. That way then I have – I'm doing everything on thursdays now because of you know obviously like with my new job i don't know what that's gonna look like um and so what i'm doing is i'm just really focusing on one day a week and a lot of my upcoming art like i have a lot of fairly well-known like children's book artists and vermont authors and stuff like ones that are fairly well known from like you know new york times bestseller kind of stuff i don't want to say who they are because i as as you might know jeff when what do you do is like you get that like email like the day of <laughs> from their agent and say um, they can't go this week because I have to pick up their kid at the airport. Oh, oh, like, I, I, oh, I've God. announced so many big guests and had them not show up. I, <laughs> no. the, at one point, at one point, there was um, you know Rufus Sewell right from Dark City and a bunch of other stuff right. Yeah. Um, I and I, I got I talked to his publicist and they're like, yeah, it's fantastic. They like, set this up. We'll set it up for next week. All right. Um, but we'll get back to you tomorrow with some times. I say, all right. So I announced on my Facebook. Rufus Sewell coming to version the stars never showed up never heard of from him ever again <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about this as well too and, and this has happened to me a lot more recently at least for two geeks talking and that's a good segue into what Jeff just went through cancellations in terms of cancellations how many have you had this year because for me it's been 15 people have canceled for this entire year so far and as a, as a show that that hurts because you're you're prepping the interview, you're doing the research, you're doing the the images and things like that. You're you're getting prepared to talk about their amazing work and then either the cancel, no show. I, I will say I am proudly been canceled on by some of the best people in the business. <laughs> Consistently. Um, yeah, it, it, it's like I said, I told you, like I had one guy cancel me four times for an interview. Um, this other lady, an actress who eventually did get, both of them eventually did come on the show. Uh, she was an actress. She canceled on me four times as well. I, I'm I'm usually get it deal with the castle quite regularly. It's just luckily I, I usually have enough guests to maintain a three week release, um, three releases a week schedule. So that's you know that's positive. But yeah, I'm canceled quite regularly. The, the ones are not as bad as are the no shows. I've had mm-hmm. some people on no show for you know, and I'm sitting there for a half hour just waiting for them, waiting, and they never show, and that drives me crazy. Um, you know. But at the same time, sometimes I come home from work and I'm just I'm glad I got the break. So <laughs> that's something that works too. Barney? Yeah, it's for, for me, it's like I I there's been times I used to do what you did, Curtis, as well, where like I would pre-plan out like I'd I'd make the I'd make the YouTube 
you know, thumbnail in advance and then book in advance and put through StreamYard um, and have it be ready. Now what I do, because I really concentrate on doing post editing and it's just kind of like a bonus to live stream for the interview. I'll just send out the link ahead of time. And then, so that way there's not, there's nothing, a lot of the pre-planning like I used to do. And to be honest, I'm wondering how much of this is my fault because I'm kind of lackadaisical when it comes to, I'll set up the thing and put on the calendar. But then what I'll do is this like, three hours before we go live, I'll send an email like here, here's a reminder. We're going to, I'll send you the link before we start. And sometimes they're like, I completely forgot because I used to be really proactive, like remind them a week in advance and three days in advance, almost like a dentist appointment. Like, you know, don't forget we're meeting. Don't forget we're meeting. And now what's the point is that I've, I've set it up almost hours in advance to remind them that they're coming on. And when I've done that, I've seen a lot of people really apologetic who forgot to show up. And what I'll do is I'll leave it open. I'll leave the link open for like 15 minutes. And then I'll wait 15 minutes and kind of like what you said, Jeff. I'm like, thank goodness I don't have to edit that right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, like in a way, it's like you get a, a kind of a break in a way, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. I, yeah I, I will say as a rule of thumb and I, and I do take it I like, the, um, I think it helps a lot. The reminder to, from them comes, always goes out 24 hours prior to the interview. I always send a reminder, the, the Zoom link they got immediately once I schedule it. Usually when I schedule it, I immediately send out the link to them to so make sure they have it. Then a reminder 24 hours before the show. Um, I find, I think publicists like it and I think it lowers stress of the guests as well. And I get a little less, I forgot about it, uh, though I still get that from time to time. Um, uh, and, and I guess I can share the, 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 the ghosts, the people who have ghosted me for a long period of time. But um, 24 hours, I would say is, you should always just do 24 hours before. Yeah. And that's a good idea. And that's something I'll have to implement in my calendar league because a lot of our, and I'm sure a lot of your interviews as well are scheduled months ahead of time type deal. So by the time it gets to that actual day, I think what I'll do is a week reminder and then a 24 hour reminder. And because usually I'm chasing for images and assets and things like that, because mm. if someone's back in January is scheduled an interview for July, they're not going to remember. It's that that's the issue where I think that a lot of a lot of creative people, whether no matter the entertainment industry that they're in, if they have a pitch package, I think that's a key factor that mm. I think we as as interviewers should be if they don't already have one, we should be actively reminding people about that because I think that'll save us a lot of time and it'll save you know keep them organized as well too well for me i, I it depends on for me on the guest um Sometimes my pitch to a guest is, I love your book. I lo you know, I, you know, you're a big fan, love your book. Now, if they say they want to do the interview, I can now then go, can I have a copy of your book? Because I just said I like it. So now I got to, you know, so I got to go buy it so I can read it to interview the guy. But once I say I like it, I can't then go back and say, can I have the material so I can look it over? Because now I'm alive. Well, of no, no, you, you can say <laughs> that, look, I saw the excerpt on Amazon. I love the concept. You know, can I actually get a, a demo copy? Hmm. Well, there, well I mean, oh, go ahead, buddy. Like, I only got like, so I, I've never, like, if there's someone that, like, I always talk about, like, like, say, like their book or something like that, or I, what I always say so, things along the line is like, you know, um, this book seems amazing. This book looks amazing. Or, you know, this book is amazing, wherever it is. But I never actually, like, never say that I've read it. And, there's only been one time it was a re it was a retired attorney general that it was on my show. He wrote he wrote a memoir, and near the end of near the end of the interview, and I edited this part out, but it was on the live stream part, uh, which people can see on my Patreon page because I have that there. Is um at the end he was like, so what did you think of the book? I'm like, I never read it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like well I'm like, done. Was, was, what was the point? Here's my like my piece is like you didn't even send me an advanced reader copy. If you wanted, if you know, it's like, it's one of those situations there where like their publishers, like, you know, normal, sometimes they'll send you an advanced reader copy. And, and he never, and he never, you know, never sent me one. So it's not, I'm not going to physically go out and buy your book with my money and interview you about it. Like if, you know, meet me halfway here, man. Like, I, was like... <laughs> I, I always have to, I always look at, uh, read, I always buy the, I buy the stuff. I, I, um, that's why I try to keep away now from graphic novelists uh, because I don't have the damn time to read their books anymore, nor do I want to spend the money to buy the book. So I keep away from, I try to keep away from graphic novelists and I try to, um, it's, it, it always feels good when I get a guest of something I'm already reading or watching. So I don't have to do the extra side work, which is always nice, but um, you, know, you, you know, and sometimes there'll be ones that are more general. Like um, I just interviewed uh, Mike Carlin 
Um, and luckily, he's not doing anything new, so it's just like a retrospective, which is easy because you can just be like, you know, I already know what to talk about. But it's 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 when I've had a few people who try to like get me to read their book and blah blah blah. I'm just like, I don't have the time for that shit anymore, man. I just don't. <laughs> I mean, I am five interviews behind in terms of editing. I I really don't have time. <laughs> like... I, I definitely got to spend more some more um time. I think um editing some of my stuff. There's um the one the one this one person got me had me edit the same video 10 times. Um, there's this actor, I'm not gonna say what his name is, but you know, um, however, his, the, the agreement was with his um, publicist was that he had um, final say on the episode. So he, so he could tell me where he wanted to cut. So I kept sending, so I sent him the rough as I like, here's, here it goes. He's like, no, you need to fix it. So I, I said, okay. So he showed me the time, told me to cut it. So I took it back, cut. I sent it back. He goes, okay, well, can you cut this part too? So I took it back, <laughs> recut it, sent it back. And I, I think we went over, I think it was 10 times. And then eventually, because uh, I kept saying, you know, rough cut one, rough cut two, rough cut three. And then eventually I wrote final rough cut. No, final <laughs> cut. Yeah. And he finally was like, okay, that's fine. I was like, yeah, I think you got the message there. Now. <laughs> final cut. <laughs> he, he had me cut a bunch of part. One part, um, is so how I learned to though to crop and zoom. Oh yeah. Um, because I I because I didn't know how to do that before. But he's like, you can tell I'm I'm I'm, I'm wiggling in my chair a little bit. Can can you can you cut that part and just focus on yourself? Because you're asking me a question <laughs> while while I do it. I'm like, I think myself, I don't know how to fucking do that. Yes. And he's like, uh, and eventually I figured out a crop and zoom. So I send it over to him. He goes, well, no, can you crop that a little bit more? You can still see a little bit on the edge. You can tell you're cropping it. I'm just like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so so here's here's a trick for that. And and I'll tell you why. One, not only does it lengthen your time of editing, it is in the long stream of things. If it is a, if the person is doing like a conscience, like a, a thought or whatever, or maybe they do like a thought and then they switch to something else, you can just cut down and, and limit uh, the amount of herbage or whatever that, that mm. actually occurs with that. And it saves you time in general. The whole thing with the final edit, I think what you would also, should also put in your stipulation even if a, if it's a publicist and they get final say, then your counter to that is, mm. uh, I have because of time factor and because I I love your you know your client etc. Uh, I have a maximum limit of three edits. Here's the major edits. Here's etc. 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 And you're not wasting time and you're not looking having to look at the zoom and crop and all this other stuff that you actively don't need. So here's a question for for the for the group: How much of an impact do you think edits affect listenership? Go ahead, Barney. I got my thoughts on that. I, I've noticed when I, I've gone back and re-edited some previous interviews I've done that were allowed ended up being 50 minutes long. I've noticed when I've edited to make them smaller, like just, I've realized there's a lot of redundancies. And what if you actually take out the ums, <laughs> I, I, I look at what the, I feel bad saying this in a way, but it's actually self-effacing is the fact that um, when I listen to my earlier podcasts that I did, I would listen to it for 10 minutes. Like, I can't freaking listen to this. Like, like this is like, this is horrible. Like I will turn myself off. I'm like, but I noticed like the later interviews I've done, like when you interview them to give them, there, there's a cadence and a pace that you, that you edit to it, that you realize that you want, you don't want to let almost to the, almost to the opposite of like someone, a DJ, like you have a slow song, then have a fast song. You want it to always be entertaining. And I've noticed that of what I've been able to do is I spent more time editing my questions mm -hmm. than I have editing the people's answers. Mm -hmm. Cause I've realized that if I edit out my questions to make them more engaging to the listener to want to hear the answer, it's actually gives yourself more permission to leave the genuine, like the genuine responses that, that your guests give with the ums or like, Oh, that's a good question. Let me think about it. <laughs> Anytime a guest says, well, that's a good question. I freaking leave that in because yep. it makes me look better too. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you on that. So I haven't been as tightly editing as I used to, uh, only because of, uh, it's a time factor is what it is. And mm. some cases, uh, some of the guests have been really good where their their entire thought is perfect. And so I'll leave that as a whole whole cut with, even with the ums and the things like that. So it's not as as bad. But... Like a lot of my banter, a lot of the stuff uh, that I have in the show, a lot of it doesn't see the light of day because either it doesn't add to it or it's just of a break or a bit of a pause or whatever. I'm not going to leave that in, but I will tighten up my questions. I, a lot of my leading stuff to the question is what I'll cut out because it either doesn't add to the flow or just 
Mm. I just didn't have, I couldn't think of what I wanted to say. So I think that, you know, the editing process, the ums, the and ums and the but ums and things like that. If there, if there's a long section where you get that in there, feel free to cut it because honestly, it just keeps that thought consistent and constant. And it just makes your life easier, especially if you're changing it into a podcast as well too. So now you have clean audio. You don't have any real breaks in between and you're using your, your, what you've already edited in a secondary format as well. So, Mm. yeah, especially like I have more people that listen to my podcast and watch it on YouTube. And I've noticed that if there's any spaces on there left might not seem as bad if you're watching it because you can actually see interactions with expressions. But when you're listening to it, they don't see that. All they hear is a blank eight seconds or five seconds, yeah. and they have no idea what's going on. You have permission to cut out those types of spaces, even if it's just a couple of frames or something like that. Then at least you've provided that that pause, and it's still a, a constant constant train of thought. So I think it's it's really great. I'm always curious about your editing process, Jeff. Are, are you a, a tight editor, or do you just let her let her fly? Um, I edit usually. I edit um, significant mistakes. Um, usually, you know, if, 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 um, I'm stammering too, too much, I'll cut a stammer too much. Um, if the guest, I usually will cut more if, if the guest is having an issue with something, but I tend to leave a lot in cause I, cause I, what I always have found is that when I do a lot of cutting, um, especially on, on the, on the video, it looks choppy. And sometimes I think it's sometimes better to leave it, look, you know, leave the mistake than get stuck with the problem and i've had too many and i've had a few times in in my time where i didn't realize it until i published it i use a window share uh, filmora a one share filmora mm-hmm. is that when i cut and stuff sometimes i real accidentally leave gaps and i slightly pull off uh, just a little bit of um video so the audio doesn't i lose a sync a little bit and i don't quite notice uh, it yeah and so sometimes i figure if unless i totally screwed up or the guest totally screwed up sometimes i figure you know what screw it just let it go you know, let it go. And um, I'm not sure. Um, and it also depends on the guest too. Sometimes I, I know the guest will not get a lot of views. So it's like, you know, screw it, just put it out there. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not worth it for maybe 10 or 12 views. Um, but some of the bigger guests I'll cut more. But I think for the most part, I kind of feel like it's sometimes better just to leave the minor mistake than to potentially screw up everything. Yeah. You know yeah. I was fine with the, the cutting and the cropping and things like that, where, where yes, you do occasionally see a jump, a jump cut or whatever, yeah. only because there's no clean way to really do video in an interview setting, unless you're like doing B roll or something, then you have something to cut to. Right. I, I think I had one interview recently where I was like, so how was my editing process for your, your past interview? Cause he had been yeah. on months before actually, he's like, you need to give me some time to breathe. <laughs> so, so I posted it as now with 90% more breath and <laughs> just to, just to, so I go, okay, I won't, I won't edit it as tightly as I, as I was previously, but as long as the train of thought is consistent and they don't veer off into any real direction, I try to keep that together as much as I can at least. Yeah. The only time, the only few times I'll cut what a, what a guest says, if they say something that I'm not sure will read well, I guess um, he says along the lines of, I got to be careful what I say so the uh, political, the PC police don't find me. And I, I'm like, you know what? Let's just cut that shit out. You know, let's cut it out, get rid of it. Um, I, there's another part um, I was going to interview. Um, I'm not, I think I left, actually, I think I left it in. Lance Hen- Henriksen. Yeah. Uh, um, I had that interview with him. And, you know, it was a crazy interview. Um, I cut a lot out. But um, so the stuff I, I, part I left in, I wasn't sure if I should have left it, but I did. He goes, um, fuck the cops. They don't know what the fuck they're doing anyway. I was like, and I sat there for like 20 minutes staring at my screen after I was editing going, do I want to cut that? No. And, and I, and I, and I sent a, a letter to, and I sent an email to the public going, is there anything specifically you want me to cut from the interview? And she said, I think the interview went well. I was like, it's in the show. <laughs> 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 but yeah, there's a part where he, he's talking about how he, you know, F the police and how much he, I don't know I'm saying F now. That's when I swore before. I don't care. Okay. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to be careful. Um, F the police and how um, the people F themselves. They're all stupid, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. And I, like I said, I stayed at my computer for like 10, 20 minutes. I figured out to cut it. I called my dad. I was like, what do you think about Lance Henderson t- saying F the police? Do you think that should stay in the show? My dad's like, did, it, did they tell you, tell you to cut? I was like, no. Leave it in the show. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that's like in the, the show. The only, 
I guess the only aspect of that would be based off of the fact that is do you don't want to exploit I, I hypothetically speaking and I don't I don't know anything about personally anything about Lance Hendricks and some like background but just as an example that I would be you know just cognizant of like any age related disabilities that might be popping mm. up and so that would like for instance a good example is that just happened what a few months ago with what's his name the guy from Monty Python um, oh uh, John Cleese or Aaron John Adams? Cleese I mean he's he's getting some age related age related disabilities some dementia whatever, where he was just kind of going off like his age is kind of pulled him off the stage to preserve his dignity mm-hmm. not necessarily the fact that it would be one thing if he was saying that same stuff for when years so like for so then mm. you know this is what you would you know comes to ex, come to expect that would be the one piece that i would um and i've done that i've done that with like some interviews that i've done with some some authors and stuff like that who i know have some age-related disabilities i'm like all right, I'm you know for your sake, you you probably didn't mean to say this. Well, so I'm gonna from the editing process, yeah. Well, well, that's why I do tell the publicists, you know, uh, yeah. let me know what you want cut. And I always, and as part of my intro to, I mean, to the guests before I put them on the show, I say, I and I give, I said you have 48 hours to get back to me with edits that you want things you want cut after 48 hours. It's in the show, but with 40, within 48 hours, you tell me there's something you're, you want cut, I cut it. Um, right. I've had a few people who came, came to me and and. Um, so they wanted something cut because they felt uncomfortable. One person, um, like the actor was, made a comment about the writing room being um, of a b- bunch of Jews, um, and, and, I, and I cut that out. Um, you know, I, I figured, you know, protect the guy. Um, I had another guy um, cut it because he was afraid that when he went back home, the um, warlord who ruled the country was going to murder him. And I was like, all right, I'll cut that out. It seems fair enough. <laughs> uh, but for the, <laughs> the last stuff, they don't tell me to cut. I'll leave it in unless it's something I know. I said like the one like the one guy who's saying something about the PC police coming for him because he said some stuff. Um, but like I said, it, it, it depends. Um, uh, but sometimes I do find I, I do find like sometimes the cure is worse than the disease. You cut too much, sometimes it, the, the show looks worse than if you just left it alone. Yeah, I, I think it uh it comes back to just the preference and all that. And as long as you have a especially dealing with publicists, as long as you have your own personal limit, like the 48 hours is a nice touch. I do like that. But I think it's like, okay, I, I'm limiting this to three edits uh, in total mm. um, just so that I can keep on schedule with my my release schedule. I think that's a cleaner way to put it. Um, that way you're you're not just bogged down with dealing with, you know, 10 edits, which mm. I, at that point I would have been charging by the hour to be perfectly honest. <laughs> it's a hundred bucks an hour for me to, to edit this process. So, <laughs> you know, go from there. Um <laughs> So I, I think it just it comes back to just you find your style that works well for your show, and I think it it as long as the overall core value of whoever you're talking with is is shown in the final product, I think it just comes back to keep being consistent with with releasing and and have fun with what you're doing. I as as a podcaster, um, I must say I'm experiencing a little bit of burnout. I think like I'm I'm getting that part where I'm I'm like I like I think I told you I'm seeing a dip in the view numbers uh, for this month. And that and that a little bit of um, burnout has has hit. I think I'm going to feel that you know that uh, it's 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 getting to be an effort to go ahead and edit instead of going ahead and just enjoying the show. So I don't know how you guys are feeling around, but I'm definitely hitting a little bit of burnout. I think. So for me, well, just getting back to the point of what you're saying earlier about the, um, what, I've always said to, I told my guests that this is a PG show, like, mm-hmm. so it's like keeping it PG. Um, and I said on it, and I said the reason why is like I like my kids like to watch my shows, so mm-hmm. um, keeping it PG. So I've always been able to edit any any of that stuff out as well um, when when things pop up. What I've done is. And I and I think about what Cody told us, like when when our on our second quarterly meeting is like, and I've always been able to make sure that I enjoy doing it based off the fact of not burning out by not doing so many sh- like I only do two shows a week, yeah. and doing it that way. And actually, the other point that I do, and I learned this from you, Kurt, as well, is that. When I first started doing it, I would do hour long shows feeling like I didn't do an hour, but because there's an editing aspect to it now, the show never ends up being an hour now anyway. So I, I now, now that I, I, I edit it, I I'm really consistent with editing because what I do is I timestamp every time I'm cognizant by seeing something happen, I'll write it down. I'm like, ah, I'm going to timestamp. So then I can actually go back into the editing part and know mm. 
where that part happens. And uh, and then I also, and so creating kind of a rhythm and, and, and kind of a cadence to it and knowing the fact that I want to keep doing it makes me not want to do more than two shows a week. Um, and that's where I feel as though like I, I'm able to uh, not get that burnt out from it is because I've been very specific on understanding my how much time I can dedicate to mm. that to the podcast um, uh, once a week and and I know my limit my upper limit I'm there's one week I did five and I'm like I only because it was people that I promised who canceled or I had to cancel mm. came back but yeah two is my max that I'm gonna I, I usually do as like my scheduling point and, and I know if I did more than that I would be burnt out too well, and, yeah, I told Kurt. I think I did. I, I, I think I did ten this week. <laughs> no, I'm um, like, out. Like, like I said, on the twenty eighth, I did. Remember that when I I canceled the crew. I, I said I couldn't do that day. I did three interviews that day alone. Um, two of them back to back. And I must say, yeah, it, it, it's crawling. It's creeping in a little bit. Where I'm just like, oh, another interview. <laughs> I think the one thing that comes back to is because I was only doing basically like Saturdays was, was my original thing until I just opened up the paid interviews, as I previously said to Sundays through Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. And there's two things that have just helped me survive for 15 years, limiting the number of interviews you do. So like you guys are doing, like, like Barney said, he's doing two a week and I I'm doing one free a week is, is basically what it boils down to currently. And then whatever else is scheduled is scheduled. The other thing is record your intro, record your outro, just get those clean, record mm. those and, and put that at, at your editing process, record, record your intro, put it into your timeline, record your outro that is consistent, put it in your timeline. Everything else is in between. Second point to that is when you're looking at your editing process and if you have multiple audio tracks, and this is key, if you have multiple audio tracks as you're editing, you'll see your audio, you'll see the guest's audio. Even if it's going through the same channel, it'll be, it can be separated. Cut the points, your in and out points as to where you're talking every single time down to the actual timeline. And once you start going through the editing process, you'll actually be able to clean up your own questions a lot quicker than if you were to just listen to the entire thing at once. Mm. And the final point to that is if you can listen to your interview at 1.5 speed, it'll make you more aware of the cadence of the actual interview itself. And it'll speed mm. up your entire process immensely. Final point is software. I know you're using Windows Femora or whatever it is there, Jeff. Yeah. Switch to DaVinci Resolve. Seriously. Like it's going to solve a lot of your headaches because there's a lot. It's a free piece of software. Okay. It is very quick and easy to edit. It will list. It will actually automatically grab all of your audio tracks and it will put it into separate tracks. And then okay. you, even if you have one video track, you'll have separate audio tracks. So you'll see the full interview, your audio your actual um, guest audio, and then there's a, a fourth one that you don't really need. But I can walk you through all that other process, and it will save you so much time and so much hassle, truly. All right. Well, like I said, you're, you know, I got some homework. When um, sometime the next couple of weeks, you gotta, um, you're gonna have to do a lesson. Yeah, let, <laughs> let's let's connect whenever you have, and, and go from there. What do you edit your stuff on, Barney? So a long time ago, it was one of those like uh, one of those Steam sales. <laughs> and I, I found a video editing software called Vegas Pro 14. Oh. Now they're like a Vegas Pro 20 something. I I have no issues with Vegas Pro 14. Like it works. Like it, it's 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 done everything. I've, I've I've never felt like I've had to limit my editing style to it. So it, it it does what it needs to do. To get back, I just want to touch back based on the point that you mentioned, but that before Jeff about how many interviews you, did you say that you did? Uh, this um, week, yeah, uh, but a, a ten, about ten. Ten. So here's so think about it this way. Think about the the time investment that you put into it. It's not just the time you do doing the interview. It's also the promoting, the editing, the uploading. So every one of those interviews you said did ten. Add probably an extra three hours for that. So the reason why you're tired, if you think about it, you probably spent thirty hours. Man, this. Man 
week on just like minimum three hours on each episode. Some of them probably took, like you said, your editing point. Some of them maybe four hours of, of like full, like, like total time on each interview. So that's where I would like highly recommend um, to anyone listening or watching is like, if you're wanting to go into this, um, there is an excitement of like a Pokemon kind of like catch them all kind of deal. Like looking at all, Oh, look at all these episodes I've done. This is so cool. Um, uh, but the dopamine high kind of like goes away as soon as like you're done editing it and you put it out there. It's like the killer I think is when you, cause, and I, and I do think it's four hours per interview. I think it's a, it's a good number. I think you came up with is when the views are not what you think they are. Is that's when you get the, the gut punch where you're just like, Oh damn it. Cause all the, it's four hours. You did not, I, 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 for me, I think it, for, I'm at the point where I think a hundred views to make a consider an episode worthwhile. And when I'm at like, when I, when I just released, I'm up to like eight eleven. <laughs> that's an absolute killer. <laughs> Look, I, I, for, for me personally, I would love a hundred views per interview, but I know my guests are, are not quite at that level per se. I understand the time investment. Like the reason why I've cut back a lot on the editing style that I, I used to have the short form, like cutting out all the, the dead air basically and the ums and the ahs and all that is because of time. I just, I don't have the time because it takes me longer to edit that. So the four hours mm. that, that Barney basically suggested about the editing process, add two plus hours onto that for me. It's at least six, seven hours for me if mm. I want to finally and tightly edit it. And I'm at the point where I'll, I'll clean up your thought. I'll clean up my questions. That's it. That's about as most I'm ever going to mm. do, really. And it saved me a lot of sanity and a lot of time as well. Well, I mean, here's this is this, I think it's basically I kind of pivot my thought process is like when I was really wanting to make sure that like, you know, it, it took me three years to get 30,000 downloads on my my podcast. I think about the fact that like I hear other people getting I got to like their podcast get 100,000 downloads per podcast. Like you think. So I think it's, it's a piece of this, the piece of the idea of like, um, I don't want is is the whole keeping up with the Joneses situation. And I I see it, for instance, I see your YouTube, like all of you have more YouTube subscribers than I do. But for me, I just feel grateful for, for being able to have good conversations with people I always wanted to talk to. Mm. And I recorded it. So, so it's like, so that's, so it's basically, it's like one of those situations where like you're, you actually have a great conversation and you're giving people the ability to watch you talk to some really interesting people. And this is where it comes down to the point of you really love what you do. And the reason why you love what you do is because, you know, we're able to talk to amazing people. And I, and one of the, one of the big kickers for me, and this is one of the big kickers, I would say, one of the heartbreaks, I would say, one of the heartbreaks about what we do is not necessarily about me, but about some of these guests that that reach out to me and say, can I come on your show? I'm like, yeah, sure. Mm. Why not? Yeah, come on my show. And then after the end, I'll ask him, I was like, have you been on any other podcasts? It's like, no, you're like, you're the only one. I'm like, and it, it breaks my heart to think about like, you are so freaking creative. Your work is so amazing. Mm. You're a lot, you're getting lost in all of this. Like, and so that's where like, I would reach That's Jeff. Sometimes you get those emails from me. I'm like, <laughs> I, I got to hook you up with Jeff. Jeff will hook you up to get you on some of yeah. <laughs> uh, I, And I always appreciate that, appreciate that, by the way, because that's always a, a little money. In my, though one of your guests was like, I put in the money. They're like, oh, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have any money to give. I'm like, did you think it was going to be free? <laughs> like, what the fuck? Dude? I'm not saying it was, but one person, they contacted me. They were like, I, you know, I was like, well, it costs this much. Like, well, we're kind of just a small, uh, you know, publisher. So we're not, we really don't have the, that kind of, we don't really have any like money for it. I'm like, I don't, I don't think he said it was bond. <laughs> My time. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. We we do have to eat and live, you know. Right, right. Yeah. It is a uh, kind of a basic bare necessity of life. Well, but. well, well. I think well, to go back a little bit to what you were saying though earlier about um people that we're talking to and and um getting them uh, airtime. I, I I find that one of the things that you know it's where, where do you draw? The, I mean, there's a thing about airtime and growth. Like I find myself like like I used to um, do a lot more I think with indie um, podcasters, yeah. I mean indie uh, co- um, creators. But I'm finding like there's no views there at all, like at all. Um, but yeah. part like part of me like does it, you know, because I want to support. But the other part of thinking to myself, four hours for ten views just doesn't seem mathematical, mathematically feasible. So where do you draw? Like where do you 
create that line where at one point you're helping those who want you want to help because you know because you want to support your you know the the community but the other hand you got to grow the show well i i hear so this is and this i think this was what i was talking about who was i talking to her so i had these two guys on the on the sh- on the show and i told them and i said you need to get these these three guys were i don't know they're in their late 50s or so these three these three guys are a hoot super super talented they make their own anthology comic series called strange gruel and they were amazing and then they asked me they said um and they and they said barney how do i get on how do we let people know our stuff i said first of all your stuff is don't hook up with indie creator i mean it's your stuff is horror you need to connect with horror comics. You need to connect with mm-hmm. like looking at the fact that indie cre- and this is I think this is a piece that I was that I was talking about at the beginning of the show is that we provide a service in order for that to happen that basically thinking about the fact and Kurt you do this well as well as, as well as like with the indie comic creators we're providing you a service, we're making you marketing material. It's your job to promote it. Yeah. If my numbers are down, if, if so, when I have a when I have an indie comic creator come on my show and ask him to come on for a third time, I pull up his YouTube videos or my downloads on that in that thing. I'm like, no, I, I'm doing this work for you, and I'm not getting anything in return. I need yeah. those downloads from you. Yeah. I'm providing you with marketing material for free. I need you to do your part yeah. and, not, mm. and and be an active participant in this marketing exchange. <sighs> I, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and it is, uh, I've interviewed a lot of indie creators and I, I love the fact that a lot of them take advantage of the free service because that's yeah. really what the show was all about when we started. Yeah. And it still is. It's yeah. just, yeah. I know people don't have funds to always go on to shows and to get a platform. I'm glad that I'm able to at least provide that for, for one, one day a week type deal. Yeah. But Going back to what she said, I've had past guests on that have come on the show, say, for a third time, and I've looked at it, and it's been, their interviews don't even have 10 views. And yeah. it's just like, what are, what are you doing? Because I've provided the graphics, I've provided the show, I've provided the platform, I've promoted on social media. Why is this stuff not hitting, especially when you're trying to promote a Kickstarter or something like that for a third time? It's, I'm doing my part, please do right. your part, because... To me, I, I can't recommend you to any other shows because it's not gatekeeping. It's just you're not putting in the effort and the work. And as as much as it pains me, right. you know, help out, please. I, I will say oh. this: um, anyone who, like anyone who doesn't retweet me, I guess you never doesn't retweet me or doesn't um, repost on Facebook, I won't do again. Mm-hmm. There's just a basic rule: is like there's like a couple of people who you know I know for a fact I shared it out, sent it out to them, and they never retweet or they or they hit like instead of retweet. You know what? Fuck you. You're not back on the show anymore. I mean, it's not worth, it's, it's not worth, it's the littlest thing you had to do is hit retweet. That's all, you know, that it's a two second step. If you don't do it, unless you're a massive guest, I brought in a huge amount of views, which some, you know, do. If you're just, you know, if you're not getting a lot of views, I can tell you didn't retweet me or anything like that. See ya. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I don't know why I would take you back on the show at that point. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you think, like I say, we're, we're, we're a complimentary marketing service that provide that expects a barter in, in return. So it was like in return for us to create a one hour, 45 minute interview that cost you $0 and zero cents. Um, in return, my expect our, you know, our, our expect, like my expectation is that you advertise, you use the yeah. marketing material I gave you mm-hmm. and utilize it. <laughs> to your benefit um and and the and, and that's where it comes down to is like i that's where what honestly i i have stopped i would say for the past year and a half i have stopped actively reaching out to independent comic creators um they'll come to me i i'll passively accept them but i've stopped reaching out to looking for them what i do now is really hone into really you know focusing on you know like children's books authors and like other and like you know long prose authors and stuff like that because i've noticed those have a much stronger reach for mm. audience than i've seen independent comic creators independent comic creators um it's almost like in a way it's it's a it's an incestual world where they we, you know we support each other but it's a it's like it's it's one small pond 
where and then the best way for indie comic creators to reach out to each other is changing your mindset to think that comics are a medium, not a genre. When you think about comics as a me as a medium, then you know that if you're making superhero comics, then you should be reaching out to video game folks or like or other folk or, or places like that. If you're making fantasy comics, reach out to fantasy novelists or reach out to the answer. If you're making horror comics, reach out to the horror, you know, crowd. But that but but so taking the idea of that, you know, really working with indie comics to say comic creators to say expand out use the indie comic scene as a place for inspiration and advice but don't use them as an audience indie comics are not going to buy i mean generally speaking um are there to support each other in the work but not support each other in 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 in, in right. buying all that stuff so it so that's where it they're great as they're great as a network for like discord and places like that where you can actually like um, talk to you, say, hey, how do you do this? How do you do this? Um, but utilizing them to expect them to buy your comics, um, that's not going to happen. Who's going to buy your comics are going to be comic book readers who like the genre that you're in. So that's well, that would I, be the I, I agree. And I think one, one thing is that I find like a lot of indie community people, both the readers and the comic people, talk a lot about you know the importance of support, importance of support, but they do not support it feels like indie podcasting. Mm -hmm. You figure like if you support indie writer x you wish you should support the show that has indie writer x on it because that's keeps them for writer y and z and everything else you know what i'm saying but i feel like there's not a cohesive support for any podcast so they'll say like i support the indie community but then it's like okay well i'm an indie show for those community but that you know the support doesn't doesn't um extend over yeah no i i, I agree with that like i <laughs> It's and that's why I was putting together this documentary for a little person amongst media giants. It's because of things like that where I've gone up to celebrities and stars and people like that and they'll be like, Who are you? Oh, you're just a little show. Okay, well I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I, I don't have time to be interviewed by you. I'm like, Okay, that's fine. But it's the same for the, the indie community. As much as the indie community is is a great place for entertainment and for amazing comics, uh, the support does occasionally feel lacking now that's not everyone obviously that's just a certain extent to a percentage of the community but those that support you know who they are i i, I agree completely because like i said it's funny i get a lot of publicists you know they'll contact me like hey i have um indie writer or my small market company blah blah to get on your show and i'm like i'm thinking to myself no not right no because i know you're gonna get 10 views 20 views it's not worth four hours of your time but you know but then what happens is and also as a publicist i'm on the other side as well i connect with a lot of indie podcasts so i can watch indie podcasts implode one after another after another and they, they don't do shows anymore they won't do interviews anymore things of that nature and it's like because the support is not there right well and then i feel like i just you know just to self-profess um part of my guilt on this is like i know when i because i'm not on twitter every day and then i gotta turn on most that you two will like retweet and like say something nice about me i'm like oh darn it okay yes thank you i'm gonna retweet this stuff <laughs> I'm like i feel so bad <laughs> no but i mean same thing i mean I, but it shouldn't just be the three of us you know pushing because at some point too the algorithms start guessing that and they don't help your numbers as much anymore but um, you know, like, but where are these hundreds and thousands of indie fans who should be supporting the places that support your, you know, your um, people, you know, your community? Yeah. Well, the I think the other thing is, you know, you look at the number of followers you have on your various social medias, and I think this will kind of wrap this up because I know we're going a little over here because I see I see Barney looking towards the beer or whatever that's behind us. Behind oh no, the I heard a bird chirp. I don't know if it was an owl or something <laughs> that was like. <laughs> uh, but um, you know, we have so much support on social. Sorry, we have so many followers on social media. It doesn't translate to our actual shows, websites, hmm. or channels, or uh, StreamYard followers, or YouTube subscribers, or, or, or everything like that. And that's what's most disheartening. It's not hmm. not always about the the shares and all that stuff. Well, that is a, a factor. It is. I have forty seven hundred followers on Twitter alone. I have seven hundred and fifteen subscribers. 
I have hmm. 600 hours watched of watch time. So <laughs> those are the, those are my numbers because it's a long format show. Jeff is hitting higher numbers for for the views as well and for the lot for the overall hours itself and and you f congrats on your over 500 subscribers that's a great milestone oh, as well too you. so you know it's, it's it's the little things that as independent creators as as we are as shows that we are we want to feel the love we want to feel the support we want to feel the sharing and the caring that we give our time and effort and our platforms to these creative people whether they're independent or professionals like help us out Help, help me help you. I'm going to pull a Jerry Maguire again. <laughs> yeah, it's you're right because as you're saying, Jeff, is like there is such a that 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 you know, like you know, people will go into it being a podcaster because they're just so excited about wanting to like do these interviews and just do like something, you know. And then as you say, then they we just you see them drop off, um, and it's it's about the long game, you know. It's um, and I got to say, you know, get back to the beginning of the show. I would not have had the expertise to buy a radio station if I didn't do have done a podcast. <laughs> like that was literally when it came to it was I've learned some of these things about, um, uh, you know, radio tower insurance, slander insurance, all these things I've been learning that I had to learn about. And the underwriters of my slander insurance asked me, what is your experience in radio? And I said, well, I've had a, I've, I've, I've done a, a podcast for over three years. I'm like, oh, okay. So it's like utilizing the fact that what we're do we're doing this because we're passionate about the medium of interviewing. The reason why we're not doing, you know, quick ten minute, you know, like, you know, how to videos or, or or unboxing things that we buy on Timu or whatever that new fad is, is because we love talking to people and we love getting getting viewers and listeners to see another side of somebody that we want to talk to. Um, and that is something that is, is a passion and there's a skill set to that, that you learn over time. And, and, and for those that go into it for thinking that it's like, this is easy. Laura just saying that this is not easy to do there. It's not just turning on a camera and talking to someone then uploading it. There is so much work involved in doing this. Hmm. And and the longer you do it, the better you you're at it. You the better you become. But the point of it, it's it's a marathon, not a race. Hmm. So you know, keeping your giving yourself a good pace and doing it for the reasons of what we're saying earlier is because, um, you know, we're we're doing the work that that other people are are not providing. So yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Geiger said it best in his interview today, like literally, and I'm going to bring this up just because I'm still stoked about it, that's all. <laughs> and he, he said, the amount of time he spends on the administrative and the social media marketing and everything like that, even though he's been in comics for 20 years and he has success in multiple areas, he still spends six to eight hours of his day, however long his day is, doing the administrative work. And it's all of that that promotion. It's all of that editing. It's all of that other stuff to get new products out. And in, in our cases, it's to get shows out. And we show the positive sides when we post our final edits. They don't see the behind the scenes stuff and the struggles that we all go through in terms of not only editing, but only in our personal lives as well to kind of get ourselves into that <laughs> extroverted state in terms of talking with the people. So. Right. And I would and like and, and point out to the for, for both of you as well is like one of the ideas is to keep in mind of the resources that we now own. We own for me, I've done 270 ish episodes. I own over 270 hours of interviews. Those belong to me. Those interviews mm -hmm. that you've done belong to you. Those are your interviews that you can utilize and use. That might be like our, you know, our Q4 conversations that we have on, you know, is like, what do you do with the resources that you've attained? And it's not just listenership. It's also mm. the actual physical hours of footage that we have. Like how, how can you monetize that now for us as well? So that could be another conversation that we could figure out at a later date. Well, the next one is uh, September. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Who's, who's hosting that? I think it's supposed to be Cody. That's, that's Cody. Cody owes us. Yeah. See? Yeah. Yeah. yeah cause, cause I have a uh, December. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. December. You have the end so, of the yeah, year. I'm the end yeah. of the year show. Yeah. You, yeah. So we we started this last December with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're cycling through. 
This is good. Yep. So let's wrap this up here. Obviously, we'll do the closing as we normally do for your shows, uh, just to keep things consistent and all that jazz. And whoever wants to start, uh, Mr. Radio Radio Station, uh, we're going to call you Mr. Barney, Mr. Radio Station times three <laughs> Smith. There you go. Yep. Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode blah, blah, blah. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we're excited to be a part of this roundtable discussions with the amazing Jeff Haas and Curtis Sasso. <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Virtual Stars podcast, though we're really on QG's talking. Welcome <laughs> aboard the mothership, and have a good show. <laughs> <laughs> Cheeky Sockings, of course. You can find this on youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. You can find the podcast, which is finally back after 12 or so years, on two geeks talking to podbean.com or just search for two geeks talking, which is just over here, on any of your favorite podcast streaming services. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking. And to hopefully we can get to keeping it geekly for quarter four or quarter three rather of this amazing podcast crew collective.